I think I can continue to admit people as they come along now and we'll get started, shall we? Um, the first thing to say, of course, is thanks very much, Jockey. That's kind of you to spend some time tonight and uh, really appreciate it. Um, I really tried one now. Oh, if we could have a, most people on um, mute, that would be helpful. And I think if you're finding that your stream is getting a bit um, jumpy and what have you, maybe um, shut your own video down. So, um, because that'll maybe just help the uh, bandwidth at your end. It sometimes helps if things get a bit lumpy. Um, yeah, we're getting up more numbers coming in now. We've got um, up to 40 already here. Um, for those that don't know, Jockey, of course, was the responsible for rejuvenating the X Lakes in 2018 and um, having the first and only time before that, 10 years earlier, when uh, Chris, who's on this call, was a participant and the late, great Steve Nash um, was the winner um, of an event organised by Gordy Oliver. And, and Jockey's um, been successfully steered the X Lakes through three iterations and I think at least two of those jockey, you know, two or three days before we thought there'd be no flying whatsoever. And we even thought there'd be uh, no fells whatsoever on one of the events because the weather was looking so bad. But we pulled something out of the bag. You pulled something out of the bag on all those three. I think the first one, we maybe didn't get much flying, but, but the other ones had some good flying amongst it. So one of the messages I wanted to get across in this session was, when you're all looking at RASP and looking at the weather two or three days out, don't forget that the lakes has a special, unique meteo conditions, <laughs> which Jockey is now going to explain, explain for us all. And it, it always throws up some su surprises. So it's going to be worth you coming, um, whatever the weather looks like, I would suggest. And um, to, to add to that, um, Caroline and Steve Ashall, who so kindly let us use their premises to be the main event HQ for this year, um, they um, also are happy to do some activities because they run West Lakes Adventures. So there's all sorts of activities that they've agreed to put on for anybody who says, well, I'm coming for the weekend and maybe I just don't really feel like blasting around those fells, or if they bring their friends and family and they want to keep themselves busy while you are blasting around those fells. Um, they're going to um, offer a discount for any participants or friends and family associated with the event to put instructors out there and equipment out there to get you out enjoying the, everything that Lakes has to offer. Um, so we saw them last week, Rod and I check, checked in with Caroline and Steve just to check everything was on target. Apparently there's still one of their accommodation pods available if anybody's not sorted out their accommodation. But equally, there's talk of a number of pop-up campsites appearing in Estale alongside the three very good campsites who are already there. So I um, do encourage you to get your accommodation sorted earlier than you might think this year because the, <clears throat> the lakes are undoubtedly going to be absolutely rammed. No question about that. Um, so I think that was all on, on Steve and Caroline. Um, the other thing to point out, if you haven't picked it up already, is that we are starting both events, not at the event HQ, but at a field that um, Joe Grove, who's a, a local lakes doctor and a pilot himself, has very kindly agreed to we can use for the, for the weekend. And um, that's very near to the Kirkstyle, which is a, a very famous pub, very important that you attend the Kirkstyle if you go to the Lake District. And um, so that's a fantastic venue for the start of both races. And you, we might talk about that valley a little bit more um, later on this evening. Um, I think on my list, that was about it. Everything else is going to plan. We've got some great trophies and awards for the event, including for obviously for the winners. Those of you who are thinking of spending the night out on the fells in the two day event, we're going to have a competition within a competition for those of you carrying your camping kit and doing vol biv style. So there'll be a winner of the vol biv event with most points alongside the overall event winner who may of course be one and the same person. And we're gonna have a Joe Median Award for the person who comes in the mid range of points in the two day hardcore event. 
Uh, and a prize for the best photograph contribution, which can come from either participants or their support team, anybody who's involved with the event. So, um, yeah, we're pleased about that. And the manufacturers have, have been excited to hear that we've been brave enough to get an event run and up and running this year. So they've been um, offering support and some interesting kit for, um, for prizes as well. So I think it'll be... Uh, a very exciting and interesting event for you hopefully um i think that was about about all the kind of housekeeping stuff uh, rod i might just ask you if you could uh, come in if you can think of anything on the kind of housekeeping and reminders side of things um that i've missed out um <clears throat> perhaps just to reference everybody back to the website which is regularly getting updated so there's quite a lot of useful information to be found on the website <clears throat> Yeah, and on that same lines, of course, the Telegram group, there was a number of people who <clears throat> still haven't got themselves connected to the X Lakes Telegram group. There is a link on the top bar there, a navigation bar to the, um, to the uh, Telegram um, membership link that um, David's, David's added to the website. But you can email any of the organisers as well if you want to get the, uh, the link to get into um, Telegram and we can get that sorted for you. So... Um, I'm sure most of you are already on there because we notified this meeting through Telegram as well. Okay, so um, that's that's it on the housekeeping. Once again, it's really, really pleased that um, Jockey can join us um, this evening and give us a little bit of a background. This came from, as I say, Ollie Clothier wanting kind of local pilots to maybe give a bit of um, local tips to flying in the Lake District. And we've got a number of those local pilots on this call alongside um, jockey of course who's um, lived and flown in the lakes for most of his life and um, yeah I think we wanted really to cover not just perhaps the flying but a little bit about you know ground skills in the area and obviously safety as well because the other aspect to jockey's life is the uh, mountain rescue and um, getting people who get into trouble off the fells so if we can touch on that as well that would be great in terms of discipline for the Zoom meeting, please feel free to add any questions and queries that you might want to note down as we go along in the chat section. And if you want to stop and ask a question, stick your hand up using those reaction tags. And um, I'm sure Jockey or myself or Rod or somebody will spot that and um, we can come in and, um, and answer, answer things as we go along. And there'd be plenty of room for a bit of a wider discussion, perhaps involving some of the other people um, towards the end, I think. Um, I'm going to put myself on mute, you'll be glad to hear, and leave it to Jockey to take us through the rest of the evening. Thanks very much again, Jockey. <laughs> Thanks, James. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, you can't all say hello, so I'm guessing you're all saying hello. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I took on the X Lakes. It was different from the previous one that Gordy did, where there was a route. I, I thought it was more um, stimulating to, to harmonize the Wainwrights um, and hiking and flying all at the same time. So it's a slightly different format, although the same name, because obviously it's sort of taking the mick out of the X Alps, really. Um, and it's fun. Uh, and the whole idea really is that you you sort of use the two days or one day, whichever, to sort of either follow a route if you're given a route, but um, if you're on the task where you can hoover up as many uh, turn points as you can, you've got to think and you've got to use your brain as well as your physical fitness and your, your tactics to get the best points. Um, and without doubt, I mean, Rod won it the first two years. And Bud won it last year through sheer tenacity and fitness and um, skill, absolute skill. Um, and all, all three, all, all two winners, um, were exhausted after the two days um, and changed their plans several times, which is key. You've got to be flexible. You've got to use the winds and things like that, which is what... Um, I was, I thought I was sort of asked to do really talk about the, the lakes and how it all works. So I'm just going to take you through some slides, show you how the sort of sea breeze influence works, things like that. Um, and then talk about the points maybe, and then just open it up to some chats. And um, I think we'd, we should also zoom more into the Lawton Valley and what the options are there. 
um, for the day one task. Uh, maybe flying back to Estelle. I don't know what the organizers' plans are, but this um, the video here. The, this the clip that you see here is when we did the North South Cup, and we had a magical weekend that again was forecast to be shit, but uh, turned out to be good. So you just keep coming, basically, just keep coming. And you've got some fantastic um, services that provided by uh, Western Adventure and. You know, it's going to be a good weekend, so just keep coming. And I'm sure the guys will organise it so that even if there's not much flying, there's still opportunities to win it, either by hiking or doing certain tasks. So I would still come. It, it's not as if you can bump the, the weekends this year because it's going to be heaving in the lakes and the flexibility won't be there. But I won't um, go on. So that's a view from... The um, skidder, uh, and we flew, basically we flew a triangle task. So we flew everything you'd want to do for the um, X legs because all the points are in the center of frills. And so, you know, to go from skidder down to Scarfell Pike across the Helvellyn, you're hoovering up a lot of turn points. Um, but also it does show where the sea breeze comes in and what it all looks like, so, which is why I'm, I'm doing it. Um, but uh, oh, there you go. So you can see that's the, the cloud base of Skidder. Um, and that's sort of morning clouds. That's what you expect. And you'd expect the base to be quite low at the beginning, just like the Alps, just like anywhere, and rising during the day. But the trouble is we've got this influence of um, the sea, which I'll talk to you about later on. But the thing about morning thermals especially here, well, I mean, when it's light winds, we're talking about anabatic flow, it's very alpine. Um, so you've got to sort of figure eight, you've got to stay quite close to the hill until you can reach a point where you can 360 and then ping off the summits. Um, and this is light winds conditions. This isn't strong winds, but I mean, in strong winds, you'd still do the same. You'd saw figure of eight, push out a little bit, get some space, do a 360. And as soon as you can, keep going with it. Uh, and you've got to read the mountains like that because the mountains, it's a lot harder to fly here. Um, I, I, I'll say um, I mean, Barney Woodhead is a very good cross-country pilot and arguably one of the best for, you know, several years. Um, smashes, you know, 200, 300k flights, whatever, in the flatlands, but loves coming to the Lake District because it's a sort of love-hate. It's, it's beautiful terrain to fly in but it's really hard. And um, he sort of has quoted several times, it's, it's the hardest place to fly. It's the hardest place to read. Um, and because, you know, you go to Milk Hill or a nice low hill, you, you just basically soar around, take a thermal, get to base, and that's it. You just go over Great Britain's patchwork quilt of fields, just top up, glide, top up, glide. Whereas here, it's different. You have to read the conditions um, you have to read the mountains, but you can't be relaxed just thinking of anabatic flow and the Alps because it, you suddenly have this sea breeze influence affecting you in turbulence and convergences, which you think, wait, what's going on here? So, you know, it wasn't the same when I took off and it's changed completely 180 degrees because you're in the wrong valley. So you have to read it. Um, so to talk from a flight, you would start off if it's light winds, you use the light winds and the sun. To your advantage so you use the the sunny sides and things like that um and you can see you know in this example the drift of the thermo is very very minimal and you're using sunny sides so east sides if you're going to do a, a good um good distance or good routes we do get a lot of this we do get a lot of tablecloth a lot of thermals coming up both sides if it's very big um and so use that and the lakes is as long as you can see that it's quite light winds so there's very little drift then have the confidence of using the sunny side and or windward side but don't be afraid to drift with the thermal because the thermal often will track and drift along shallow ground and then stick to the hillside and then release off the main summits and you can see from all sorts of track logs you can download um, you can get that feeling from uh, the Lake District. It's very much 
drawing in to the high points, letting you go in. As long as it's not too windy and you get blown over the back, let yourself get drawn in and you'll ping off the summits. Um, and so sometimes you can have two people working either side of, of that hill and it'll still work fine. Um, also, the same as the Alps, the thermals are in the same places. So you can see here, this is just crossing out the central fells. And you can see that the, the track at the top is me going out uh, to Conison Old Man. And the track at the bottom is me coming back in. In fact, that's hiking up um, and then taking off, soaring, doing the usual soaring, thermaling, and pinning out exactly the same place. So the sun does move around and you just use the sun just like the Alps. But what you've got to be aware of are valley winds, um, which we'll talk about. So usual story, just follow follow the sun really as long as it's light but here's a good example of valley breeze so this is um looking down uh, and it's looking down sort of bottom here and you can see the wind starting to draw up and you can see towards the sea is very blue um it's already quite stable it's sea breezing and that's your telltale that's when you know okay that's starting to happen so you can imagine the lump of cumbria is a big ball sat like a like a, a buttock with um, the Solway at the top and, and Morecambe Bay at the bottom. And so the wind draws in various valleys. And this one is one of the main ones. Um, and it comes up, this is now turning around 180 degrees looking north. It then comes up Honister, over the top of Honister, over the top of Borodale. It was also coming in from Bassenthwaite, the north. And it sort of, converges with all this thermic area in the mountains and can form clouds boom and there's your sign because when you're looking when you're standing on the lakes you can see it's um you can see it's quite blue over to the west and it's quite cloudy over to the to the east and that that's when you got your sea breeze coming in and you can see it coming in faster in different valleys depending on the lapse rates um, and how unstable it is but it's a question of using those and when you're planning your route, you want to ideally, if you get it so that you use that convergence, you can pile up and down the middle of the fells, choosing when to drop east off that convergence very beautifully. So it's one thing to sort of note, but uh, it looks a little bit like that. That's looking at it. So if, if I go back, imagine a paraglider under that cloud there, the, the cloud that's the furthest north. I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse. There's my mouse. You can see my mouse, the, the further north cloud. So imagine that a paraglider under that, looking back, you can see the line of cloud. You can see it's slightly blue. Uh, and that's when you can see it's got a convergence line. Um, and so you don't want to pile into the blue necessarily. You might as well change your course and stay under the lift to use that convergence to your advantage. So it looks a, a little bit like that. Um, and you can tell, you know, You've got a lower base, you've got a varying base, uh, you've got more of a cloud street effect going on. But what I would say is be very careful when you're coming into Central Fells, into um, Scarfell Pike. So this is, this is just, that's Wasdale, um, Waswater and Wasdale. And this is the group of North South pilots just thermaling up. Uh, it's still okay. There's still a nice cumulus line out to sea. So there's still no sea breeze. So there's no threat of strong winds. But if you get there late, the pilots who got there an hour later got absolutely trashed by strong sea breeze pouring over the top, rotor, all that sort of stuff. So you've got to read that when you're flying in the lakes and you've got to think, right, there's no point pushing into that because I'm not going to get anything and it's exposing myself to risk. So it's just understanding. If you see cumulus clouds, you normally it's normally okay to fly there because sea breeze hasn't come in but just look at the shape of it uh, quite often the early signs of a sea breeze or wind coming from the sea is a lower cloud pouring over the higher mountains uh, and you can see that effect as well happening before all the convection starts so if it starts to happen like that you start to think okay the west's not available to me anymore i've got to start thinking of routes to the east um so this is climbing just underneath Scar fell, and you can see the beautiful clouds, the lovely convection, but you've got to be careful. You know, yes, you've got to stay close to get up, but always be respectful of the wind 
you know, it's not always anabatic alpine because you've got this lovely thermic lift here. And as you top out, as you get above Scarfell Pike, you'll suddenly get hit by a possible westerly wind. So be aware of that. Be aware of the shear layers, basically. Um, and this is the sort of the way the winds affect you. They draw in from the south uh, and they draw in more southwest as you get further north. And then from the north, they, they're actually coming in from the northwest down Bassenthwaite Lake and converging into Keswick. And that's why you can always see the sailing boats on the lake start pointing up towards Bassenthwaite. And that's when you know a sea breeze is coming in. Same with Buttermere, same with Waswater, um, same with Ennerdale. And then in Windermere, it starts to actually come south, a south wind. So this convergence line starts to set up. You can see a little cloud street, but that cloud street moves as the wind comes in and converges with the anabatic flow of the normal thermic air. And that's what you should use. You should read that cloud street and move with it. Don't fight against it. A lot of people fight against it thinking, oh, I'll just plow into the, into the blue, but uh, it often doesn't work. And this is looking down Helvellyn. Um, and you can see there's still nice clouds. It's not screaming out sea breeze or anything like that. Um, and it's just, you know, having that confidence to read the clouds. Um, so looking around, that's all quite benign. That's, you've got start of convergence happening, which is down the, the spine really, from Skidder all the way down um, towards Glaramara and towards Green Up Edge, all the way down the middle. And that's what you're looking for, that uh, line of lift. And what you don't want is blue sky beyond it because you won't get in it. So that's looking at the broader picture of the effects of the sea coming in from the south and coming in from the north. Um, but you've got to be aware of that um, when planning your route because it's really, you know, route planning is critical for this. Um, apart from the day ones where you're going to give, be given a task and what you should get from the organisers, you've got huge amount of experience you've got rod welford you've got all the top local pilots will all be there and will all be prepared to share knowledge and what you want to be asking is what are the winds likely to do during the day not just now but during the day what's likely to happen how where's the sun going to come what the effect of that sun is and what are the winds are they going to overpower the sun uh, or is the sea breeze going to overpower that so you've got to think about that the reason Lawton was chosen was because it's a fantastically wide valley and you've got so many options, morning options, afternoon options to, to have routes um, and to fly along ridges in order to get back to Eskdale, to get back to the goal. So, you know, that's a great place to fly. So you should do a lot more research around Lawton um, and around sort of Burnbank and places like that to fly because they're big mountains. They draw a lot of air up. And it's really nice to go across, you know, Red Screes and up to Haystacks and up to Fleetwood Pike and into the Central Fells. Brilliant. But you, you're going from a wide valley, open, lovely, lush, to craggy big hills. So if it's windy, just really be careful of being pinned because you get drawn in very easily. And then you get suddenly get pinned right at Fleetwood Pike, right where you don't want to be going over the back. So... You know, have a bit of respect for the lakes. It's, uh, it's a lot harder to fly than you think. Um, so, yeah, that's just the, the sea breeze effects. And it draws up from Windermere, which is interesting. And quite often, um, you know, you, you've, you've, if you're doing a triangle, for example, when Mike Cav was doing his first triangles, you're looking at starting in Langdale or to the east, um, Yoke or somewhere like that, and then flying as quickly as possible to the west, bagging a west turn point, and then using that west wind to track northeast up towards Blencathra or Clough Head, and then down the Helvellyn range, and then into the east. Um, and then maybe back whilst the winds die down on a glide over Once Fell and Ambleside, and back to your starting point in that Langdale. So that's what you're using. You're using the winds um, to your advantage. But obviously, if, you, if you're hitting a headwind, you're not getting anywhere, anywhere then you've got to turn, turn around. So you can see there, that, that's Scarfell Pike. And you can see the whole mountain range, the sort of massif that's there. 
and you can see the sort of nice high cloud base, easy. So this is from one location. So this is looking around. I just wanted to introduce you to the whole 360 of the place. So I'm flying right above Fleetwood Pike. I'm looking south towards Scarfell. And your valley where you're flying is just to the left. So your Lawton is, um, I have to see if I can get my mouse. I can't find my mouse. Uh, is down to the uh, to the end of Crummock Water, the second lake. And so you can see how wide it is and how many options you've got. But as you come up towards um, the fleet with Pike, it gets a lot narrower. So you've got to be careful. So that's now looking west. And then this is now looking northwest, Grassmoor, Winlatter Forest. And that's um, Bassenthwaite Lake. That's where the wind draws in from there. So you can imagine it's going around these mountains and drawing into Keswick um, and then that's looking at Keswick and Cat Bells and, and Derwent Water and Skidder in the north um, but you can see even there you've got lovely high cloud bases it's still blue over inland but you're always better off going inland later on in the day because you get more chances. Helvellyn is your your um, motorway up and down to bag points but also you've got to think when you're on Helvellyn can you drop back to get the big points in the east? So if you are trucking up and down Helvellyn in the convergence or even in dynamic wind flow, at what point do you track east to then join the, the big pointers um, over on High Street and on Ullswater uh, and then seeing if you're going to choose that, that area and then tab it back the next day, depending on the, the weather, whether it's going to blow to the east or to the west. Uh, and then that's Borodell. And th that, this is where the, the line of convergence will go down. It goes down to the left side of that Borodale range, green up edge. So where the mountains meet from Borodale to the Helvellyn Valley is where you get a lot of convergence setting up. And then that's looking south back towards Glaramara. But you can see here, that is about, I can't remember how many pilots did it that day, about 30, I can't remember. Um, a lot of the southerners didn't turn up because of a crap forecast. But that is one day of flying. Um, same conditions, obviously. Light May, beautiful conditions. Uh, and that's all the, the routes. So you can see the general route. And that's pretty much with a nil wind, that's what you'd do. Uh, whether you're going from south to north or, or whatever, that's generally the route you'll take. And you can no you notice how in the middle, this is Glaramara uh, and this is Borodale. And that's where you top up in order to then connect to either go to Helvellyn or to go to the south, down to Windermere and beyond. But the bridge between the Western Fells and the Eastern Fells is usually green up edge. Uh, so you either Bowfell, the Central Fells, uh, or, and Langdales, or Borodale, green up edge, Helvellyn. They're your two bridges you cross if you're going to fly a triangle around the Lake District. And then once you're on Helvellyn, you can see Helvellyn is just a motorway up and down, ridge soaring basically. So if you think about that, that route, and then you add on these turn points and you think of the value of the turn points, you know, um, so the, the 10 pointers, the 15 point, I don't know how you're working at this time, but it should be hard, the more points, the harder the turn points. So you, you think to yourself, right, if I want to get the big pointers out to the west or down to the south, then go back and look at these routes you can take to use that, to use the, the winds to your advantage to get those points. Because if you can get to, to that area, fly a lot, and then just tab it back or fly back in an east wind, or if you manage to do it down in the southwest, if you just get another southwesterly flow, you can fly back up through the lakes and home. Tomorrow we're probably going to be flying from Coniston Old Man up into the Central Fells, up Cat Bells and into Keswick and what, I don't know where we're going to go back. But anyway, you, you, think, you think about that, but it's, it's also very um, interesting because it changes and you might be tired, the winds might change, the cloud base often gets people because they all think, oh yeah, I'll go to that ridge and I'll take off. But when they get there, they're leaving at seven, eight in the morning. 
So they get to that ridge and there's no lift and the cloud base is low. So they can't even fly. So you have to think about that. Well, it won't be high cloud base. If they waited for two hours, it'd be perfect, but they don't want to wait. So you've got to think, right, whilst it's bad, whilst it's low base, can I bag any, any turn points before I actually fly and use the thermal? See, so it's about planning the day and planning the conditions as well, if you're going to do the two-day expedition. That's it. That's eat, drink, and uh, be merry. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Have I been muted all this time? No, you're there, Jock. That was fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. That was that was bang on the money, really. Um, we are sort of swapping the points around a little bit in that the ones closer to Estelle are lower scoring, and those up in the north, which were you know behind um, Skiddo, um, where we've always had them the lower scoring end, they're now a higher scoring, of course, because they're further away. But but same principles, of course, as as before. Um, yeah, that uh, I was quite interested in what you said about that um, last point there about. Um, planning your day so that you know that time in the morning before it becomes flyable um i we me and rod when i've supported rod have run into that problem a, a number of times you put yourself in a good place for a good start the next morning forgetting that there's not really going to be any flying for the first four hours and yeah. um, and quite often i remember at hard knock both with greg and with rod you know, wake up in the morning the cloud base is you know 500 feet below you and you actually spend the first four hours in cloud um you know charging around with difficult navigation so it is it is worth thinking about getting yourself at the end of the first day in a place where you can do quite a lot of um peat bagging on foot um for the large part you know a third of the next period of time you've got available to you really and i think that's often something people forget yeah, and also do you thinking about what if I do if I need to do a valley crossing, I you know I can fly go, go up, fly down, go up, fly down, and but you've got to be aware of cloud bases and the times of day really. And what was beautiful last time we had quite um, strong winds at the end, but that the times when Saturday night when the days go on and you can still soar in lovely gentle breezes in the evenings and really maximize the day it is a, a good thing to think about you know and just using that calm air to do that final glide to position yourself perfectly but you've got to think you have got time the next day to position yourself somewhere good you don't have to race up to a peak and sit in cloud for two hours because that ain't going to happen either yeah, I think this year, because we're, we're going a bit later, Jock, with the COVID uh, regulations, um, the evening's going to be even longer this year, of course. And so yeah, that point yeah. we make about, we probably will have the end of flying time probably an hour later than we've done in previous editions. Yeah. Um, because it's going to be more daylight. So it's a, it's a really good point, that, that one about doing a lot with those long, calm evening conditions. Um, yeah, don't get too tired too quick. <laughs> Rod's got... You can do a lot in the evening. You know, we... Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, we can we can do a day's sort of tandem or, 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 or training, and then um, we can then set off. We can go to Jenkin Hill, which is Skidder or Walla Crag, and fly all the way down Borodale and land down at Stonethwaite. You know, on, on a gentle, easy, soaring glide, not even thinking about it. And there, you've probably bagged about five peaks in a, in a one in a calm evening. So if you get conditions like that, you don't be too tired to use that. Yeah. So you've got to, that's why you've got to plan it and think of all that daylight, all that time to maximize. Don't exhaust yourself. You know, stop, have a good hour's eating or whatever it is so that you've got that little bit of energy left in your tank whilst the conditions are still good. There was a comment here about um, opportunities to refuel or source drinking water en route in the Lake District, um, Jock. What do, you, what do you think about that? Yep. Um, I always take two little bottles um, of the, with the one that's there in the picture uh, and <laughs> just fill them on mountain streams. Be careful of, you know, you don't have to go 100 metres up and check for dead sheep and everything like that. If you have a drink of it and you feel it's fine, then if it's a babbling brook and you can see upstream is quite clear, then and you're high. The higher you are, the, the cleaner it generally is. Uh, but always take it from good moving water and good aerated water. 
and have a drink of it first, see what you think. But yeah, I wouldn't rely on it because in June, we I remember doing the first one, there was there were no streams up high. They completely dried out. Uh, and if you've only got one bottle, half a litre, and then you're considering going four hours up into Big Fells, you've got to be careful. So in that situation, I would have backup. Uh, the, the, whenever you cross, you know, you cross Honister, you cross Buttermere, you always come across cafes where you can buy ice creams or get water, but you can get them from the Fells as well, no problem. But I wouldn't rely solely on that. Um, and, you know, it, at worst, you could take little iodine tablets and chuck them in, but, um, you know, be careful. Uh, but yeah, you can drink them, but don't rely only on mountain streams. And whenever you can fill up, fill up. Yeah. That's what I say. And Dave Duet was saying, is there a normal time when the sea breeze begins to move inland? Um, there isn't. It depends on uh, the lapse rate and the pressure. So the, the better the lift, the more that it'll draw in. So that's a gauge you have. Uh, we have of how likely it is to sea breeze, how quick it is to sea breeze. Um, but the guys will tell you when it's close to the time, the local pilots will tell you uh, good weather detail and general timings of sea breeze likely. But on a good day, um, on a sort of anabatic day where you've got east thermals actually happening, then it will take about, it'll be about one to two o'clock before it pours over Scarfell. Um, but you can see it. Uh, you can see the cloud changing, cloud base changing. You can see it blue uh, and you can see a line of darker cloud. And that's obviously indicative of the convergence. Great stuff. Um, Tim Chapman says, what weight have people carried and done best? Rod, you might be able to tell us about your kit, having won it twice. Yeah, Rod will be best. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've kind of gone with skinny kit, really, um, on the basis that it'd be quite a lot of footwork because it's very long days. Um, so I think I was carrying nine kilos, but that's with everything on. That's with fluids and food and everything. Um, the wing, the reserve and the harness um, would probably be around seven. Um, yeah, so my philosophy has just been to keep moving, to keep moving, to keep moving. Um, and it's a, it's a very long day and you're right, you get very exhausted at the end and I've made some very bad decisions at the end of the uh, the days when I've been tired as well so always question your decisions at the end of the day yeah the last year uh, Dave D Dangerous Dave um, had every amount of kit you could imagine he wasn't particularly lightweight was he really I think he took his full camping gear and everything with him didn't he full uh, full uh, full Alps Vol Berva kit that probably helps with ballast in that turbulence you had at the end. <laughs> I mean, Dave, Dave flies. You can't use Dave as a benchmark because he's a fabulous pilot with an innate amount of skill. Um, and he ha has got that confidence, that Craig or Maurer confidence in strong winds, which a lot of people don't have. You know, th they're scared of it and therefore they're jumpy, therefore their flying skill isn't as good. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be careful. I mean, last year we were quite lucky, you know, when we had that strong winds from the east and everyone was flying on the east side of Helvellyn, desperate to come back. I mean, if you imagine people that aren't used to strong winds, aren't used to mountain flying, you're starting to stack up variables there. So I, I'd be careful. Mm. But um, as far as weight is concerned, the general general consensus, depending on what you're allowed to do, is yeah, as light as you can possibly get. And bearing in mind, you're probably doing more hiking than you will flying. Yeah, you didn't uh, you didn't fly last year on that windy session, did you, Rod? You chose to stay on the ground when it was strong easts. It was too too windy for me. Yeah, brave guys there, Bud and Dave, um, tackling flying on that Sunday. Yeah, full credit to them. It was beyond me. But that's what's great about this the this, this sport and the event is... I mean, you know, you're able to say, yeah, that's that's me. But I think that the risk comes when you think, well, they're doing it, so I'll do it. And that's when it becomes dangerous. Um, you know, you, you can see if someone's flying and then you think, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And that that's, ah, 
what makes me nervous. Yeah. But you, you have to say to yourself, if I was on my own, would I take off now? And if the answer is no, if it wasn't this competition, would I take off now? If the answer is no, then don't. <clears throat> that flows really nicely into the next question, Jock, where T-Bone Phone, not sure who that is, says um, three top tips for newbie pilots. That's probably number one, isn't it? Um, fly within your fly within your own skill set, really. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's easy for us to say that, James. I mean, you know, fly within, say within your bubble because no one pushes themselves. You've got to go into the arousal zone. You've got to, and that's what the X Lakes is for. It just pushes that. You know that there's a sort of infrastructure. You know that the weather's okay. You know, it's your call, obviously. But you can think, you know, and there's that lovely stimulus of, oh, just, but there's a point, there's a tipping point where you're tired. You've got to think of all the variables playing their part. I don't know the area. I'm tired. It's windy. I wouldn't fly on my own. My own. You know, this is that starting to get a bit too ridiculous. That's when the tipping point comes. And, and a good athlete, a good pilot should know themselves and when to say no, like Rod did perfectly. So no, I'm, I'm prepared to let my title go because I'm not prepared to risk that. My life and my enjoyment of this sport is more important than a podium place. So, and that's the way you should think really. Yeah. T-Bone phone has their hand up. I don't know if you want to expand on your question there, T-Bone, or whether you're just drawing attention to your, your top tips for newbie pilots. Not sure whether there are any other tips for newbies for the one day. For the one day, yeah, I, I uh, definitely for the one day is um, you're probably going to be given a route. Is that right, Rod, James? Yeah, basically we're we're thinking of doing the same as you did last time, um, Jock, where we'll say get those three peaks, but if you get any more peaks, you get more points. So it'll Brilliant. be a, there'll be a there'll be three peaks in the Lawton Valley. Uh, near to the Lowe's Water, they're starting and finishing in the Lowe's Water field. We're not going to send them down the central uh, central fells because it's a bit a bit rad down there, unless unless it's a particularly pleasant day. But um, if they wish to go and fly and collect more peaks, then that's fantastic, and they'll get more points. Because what you've got is yeah, yeah. Rod's done some brilliant flights there, and you've got this wonderful wide valley that um, you've got huge versatility of the the task and the route so then look at just think of the time you've got and think of the points work out the points work out you know is it worth getting more turn points than getting in early and think of that just work out that system but um just enjoy the day and enjoy the lake district because you think of the day one task is is basically getting used to the area so that you could do the day two task next year um, or do other uh, hike and fly comps it's just a way of training getting used to the area so you know set yourself realistic goals and just use the day to push yourself don't come get in super early having just done the minimum you know see so you maximize your points maximize the day and maximize your enjoyment really yeah fantastic um there was one that was there's here a techie one it might be one that's better for rich um, to comment on. So I'll, I'll hold on to that, Dave Ross, about um, bagging the turn points and um, how to know where you've gone, because I think Richard's our man on the old technical side and the instruments. Yeah, there. definitely. I'll <laughs> so, to that one. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. But I, all I can see is disappeared again. So when Richard comes back, somebody shout up and we'll get him to deal with that. Um, Ray's saying about, um, <clears throat> will we be getting the day one guys to return against... I'm here, James. Ah, great. Um, well, we'll come back to Ray's comment. Uh, Richard, uh -huh. um, Dave Ross here is saying um, in reg regards to um, keeping tabs on the Wainwrights you bagged without setting a, fist a fixed task of waypoints, um, how pilots have done that in the past. I mean, I know that Rod was a Fly Sky high user and can talk about how he's used that. Too. Yeah. But you might have some comments about other instruments and other ways of doing that. Um, you know, knowing where you are with um, the, because the, not, I know from scoring it with you, that not everybody did seem to have an idea of the uh, radius and um, some people narrowly missed things and other people went very deep on every Wainwright. Yeah, um, I mean, this, this is a different type of competition. Um, most flying instruments or flying applications are not good at scoring or 
you um, being utilized for this type of random turn point tagging. Um, as you said, by far the best uh, app for it is Fly Sky High. Um, with Fly Sky High, which only runs on iPhones um, for the Android people out there, um, you can um, set all the turn points, um, the Wayne writes as turn points with the 400 meter cylinder, and it will show them all on your map screen. And when you actually fly into the cylinder or walk into the cylinder, it will ping to let you know you've achieved the turn point and the turn point will turn gray. So you know you've got that one. Um, other uh, applications or software, you can display the cylinders on your map screen, um, but most of them you have to put a route in to um, navigate through them, and then you have to do it in order, so it doesn't, that doesn't really work. So you can see them on your screen with the cylinder and the, the uh, radius, um, but it's much more difficult to use. Now, I know there have been requests put in for um, XC Track, which runs on Android, to do a similar thing to what Fly Sky High does, so random turn point tagging. Whether that will be implemented in time for this competition, I don't know. Um, other applications that you can use are things like uh, Memory Map, where you can display all the, um, the waypoints on the map screen with the cylinder. You'd have to take it, just remember which ones you've tagged and which ones you haven't. Cheers, Rich. Um, does that answer the questions? <clears throat> See what Dave says in a minute, I suppose. Yeah, yeah thanks Come a lot. Cheers, Richard. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, Dave. Um, Angus, this is one for you, Jock, because it's a it's a, a mount rescue question, really. There's a few um, area danger areas we've identified on the X Lakes map. I think I mentioned to you, Jockey, that Piers Gill and Broadstands and stuff like that. We've marked them as as kind of well known black spots for rescues for terrain. And um, Angus was suggesting maybe some wise words about those those kind of areas around the central lakes that are kind of notorious. Um, just to kind of give people some background really would be useful. Well, if you don't, don't go in. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the big mountains, uh, I would, if you're flying in there, just make sure you really are comfortable. Um, either it's before the sea breeze has come or it's after and it's all settled into evening, calm uh, laminar flow. Um, so choose your moment. Uh, the big mountains... I mean, it's hard because you, 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 I'm, it's easy for me to say don't go in there, but that's wrong because you, you can go in there in right times and good conditions. But if, it, if it's not comfortable, then obviously don't fly. But the Piers Gill and the Central Fells are fine to walk in. Everyone walks in them. Um, but again, it's a different world up there. You, you should all be mountaineers and used to operating at... Um, 2,500 feet and above to 3,000 or so, and on craggy ground. Um, and the tarns up there, there's, there's moving water up there, easy. Uh, and there's, there's, there's tarns and stuff like that. But um, camping and things like that, be aware of the cold, high altitude. It is June, so it should be all right for that. As far as uh, rescue, there is limited um, tracking in the central fells. So... What happens is you tend to, I don't know if the, the new Bob Graham trackers are going to work better, but um, what we found is there's quite sketchy coverage in the central fells. So be sort of aware of that for the organisers. You know, if you're moving somewhere or if you've come out of the central fells and, you know, let them know. It, it's, does, you know, if you've got a phone signal, it would really help. And you're at, in a valley somewhere then it'd be really nice to just phone in and say, I'm here, just to alleviate the stress of the organisers. Because when you get into that black hole of the central fells, it's quite stressy not knowing where you're going to pop out. And, and, and for the organisers, not knowing where you are is tremendously sort of, uh, it looks unprofessional to rescuers. They say, well, you're organising this event, you're tracking these people, so where is he? And you say, well, I don't know, he went in the central fells and he hasn't popped out yet. And they're like, well, what the hell? So, you know, you've got to be careful and just help them to help you. 
if you see what I mean. Just if, if you're in a, an area, you can use a phone, then ping a phone message or whatever, just to update your crew or, or the organizers is always helpful. Um, as far as if you get hurt in the central files, there will be, you can use 999, uh, you can use your emergency spots. And what will happen is it will be tagged. And I think our rep is Stuart Holmes from the X Lakes will be there. But what happens is with the any trackers, there's an emergency number. So when you press SOS, it'll go to the emergency number and the, the, the uh, call center that deals with the SOS will phone that number. And that number should be a landline or a permanently contactable number, not a mobile that goes in and out of signal. And that's a number that someone's 24 hours is listening to. And it'll be the organization. So they'll phone the organization. They'll say, oh, a spot was pinged um, or a, a tracker or whatever it is was pinged. Is it genuine? And that's the question they'll ask. Is it genuine? And you say, yes, it is. Then they'll throw all resources out. So Kinloss will be informed, where helicopter rescue, they'll inform the area, whether it's going to be Keswick Rescue Team or Wasdale or Langdale. Uh, and then all resources will be thrown at it to, to come and get you out. Um, whether it's a, a stretcher carrier or helicopter depends on the team uh, and what they, they deem is required, really. But that's how the system works. But if you get injured, um, stay where you are and make sure you, you just remember you've been running or you've been exercising, so you'll get cold very quickly. So a lot of shelter. Make sure you're visible from the path. Imagine they're coming up from the valleys uh, and it's going to go nighttime maybe. So it might be night. So make sure you've got a light or a torch. So a torch is great because we see better in the dark or in dusk if it's a torch fly flashing. If it's windy and quite bad weather, whistles, we can't hear them. So running up to you with a whistle, not going to hear much. But a whistle and a torch, perfect. And as soon as you see movement, as soon as you see people walking towards you, especially if they're wearing red jackets, then... Uh, make sure you make contact, you know, get a signal to them and then they'll locate straight on you. But if you've popped your spot, they'll know you, uh, you know, know your location pretty much. And our representative will be able to inform them as well. So there'll be ongoing updates. Does that answer your question? That was a very comprehensive, I thought, so pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, although along that subject, Jorgen um, is saying, is there a map of existing obstacles like cables and antennas? I think that's particularly common in the Alps, isn't it? And if yes, is there an electronic version they could download to the GPS tracker? Um, you know, you'll know better than me, Jock, but I don't think we've got that same kind of obstacles in the lakes, have we really? Um, no, we, we don't have wires. No. So um, our obstacles are, aren't tele cabins and wires and electrical cables that span valleys that they don't generally. No. The obstacles are generally in the valley floors. Yeah, and the cables um, tend to follow the roads, don't they? And cables and power lines follow the roads and go to houses. So we don't have cables spanning valleys. So we haven't got that problem. No, no. Um, Tim's asking about, are we given spots or required to bring our own? You'll be given, um, Tim, the open tracking trackers have an SOS button on them, which will, uh, but they are only um, the data card uh, system. So as Jockey says, there are black spots, known black spots, although the ones we're using this year um, are all, all network and, uh, you know, he, the, ba the black spots are a little bit less, um, uh, you know, they don't, they don't feature as much of the lakes as, as the previous trackers that we've used. So, um, but no, I think it is a good idea on the two day, if you have got um, SAT devices um, or um, personal location beacons to take those yourself. And they would, you know, be, they would certainly be a recommended part of your toolkit really, particularly for the two day guys. One day guys probably won't be out of sight for long and there'll be enough people in the valley and I don't think there'll be a big problem, but um for the two day guys, I think really it would be our recommendation that you you bring a sat tracker and we're not supplying any. So um, that would be that would be a good idea. And we'll try and get those um, uh, sat track um, contact details off you, your communication details off you before you um, set off as well so that we can use that for communication if we have to. Yeah, I'd agree with that, James. And also 
um, if you've got an in reach or anything, then get make sure you've got our numbers, the XX organizers' numbers. And yeah. if you've got a ground crew of people that you're working with, one, have a buddy system, but also two, make sure you inform the organizers. There's nothing nicer than you know having a roll call at the evening and knowing everyone's safe. Uh, yeah. And so just a little phone call to say, yeah, my guy's down, he's here, is fantastic. Yeah. Um, Ray, Ray's worried about the sea breeze. He's saying, is it wise to be having the, um, the one day event in the, in the valley for early effective with sea breeze and we're going to have them all walking back against a hard blowing sea breeze at the end of the day? Um, I, I would have thought, Jock, I mean, you say how you use the sea breeze, isn't it? It's a tool rather than a threat in that regard. Yeah, definitely. D don't let me alarm you about sea breeze. All we're saying with sea breeze is one, if you're the wrong side of big mountains and a sea breeze comes in, it can be bad. But if you're the right side, it's fine. So Budamir Moss, for example, that, that, that's at the head of, um, well, mid-range of Budamir Valley, uh, but downwind of, of Lawton. Um, so you'd be on Grasmere, you, you know, more, you'd, you'd be on a whole range of mountains that you would actually benefit from a sea breeze. So you could use the morning sun, the sort of east face in the morning. You can then track over some peaks and start using... Um, the sunny faces and then if the sea breeze comes you can then saw the sea breezes along to do your route so it's yeah. not like a sea breeze comes in and washes everything out it doesn't it, it'll draw in it might if it's very low you know good lapse rate it might draw in quite quickly for a while but it calms down and it all becomes quite nice and laminar and you can have hours of soaring evening flying so there's no problem there yeah but we got we got to get back to base by about four o'clock but jockey so it kind of kind of knocks us out for half the day. Yeah, but back to base as in goal or back to base as in base base. Yeah, back to base in Horton. Yeah, uh, goal. Oh, okay, well, four o'clock. But well, they they yeah. might extend it. You never know. If the weather's suitable, they might extend it. I I, I can't answer, but I, I I wouldn't imagine they would want you on the ground when the conditions nice. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's safe to do so, they'll open the the task or the gates or whatever you know there's nothing worse than landing and then you can see three hours of fantastic flying to be had yeah. it might be that the task is finished but you everyone goes up and flies butter moss or something fantastic like that you know you just don't I think, know um, i think one thing to say ray i mean don't forget this definitely is a fun comp pilots for pilots if the pilots on the friday night and looking at the conditions and chatting amongst the people with local experience say i tell you what it'd be better to start in lowes water and finish at um, dale head or something um then then that's what we'll do you know um we're not completely we're not completely welded to it um, we've got to balance <laughs> that against the fact that people have had five months of planning precisely what they wanted to do and if we go and tell them the night before that we're doing something different um we might have a mutiny so it would have to be decision by the pilots and in particularly you know we're going to probably have a little um you know expert group of pilots who who, who are local knowledge who would say yeah that's definitely workable and they would help us appoint the task you know and, and nominate the peaks for the one day crew that that make most sense you know we might have, you know we might even send people sort of Winlatter route and low fell and stay at that end of the valley rather than going down to the uh, but Budamere end of the valley so um i think um i think i think we can deal with it to be honest ray i think we're just it's really about getting the most flying and the most experience out of the day really if we can cool yeah. thanks uh, not got many more there, Jock. Um, one thing I would say relative to what you're talking there about the, um, the mountain rescue um, processes is we'd encourage everybody to look at your previous talk, which Andre Badera recorded at the Kendall Mountain Festival. Um, we've put that YouTube clip onto the X Lakes website for people to look about how the mount mountain rescue services and the triage for mountain rescue works, particularly for paraglider pilots. So um, it, we'd encourage people to just spend 20 minutes having a look at that. That's an excellent, an excellent, good bit of background, really. Um, yeah, there's uh, also stuff uh, we did. Th 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 this Some of those pictures are from mountain flying in the lakes. So it's good to see that. There's also good to see Greg's films on flying in the X lakes and things for research. Um, and yeah, just do your research on the previous routes. I don't know if Rod's put his routes up. 
from the previous years. Um, and just do it, and you, you got to remember what the weather was like then, what they did with the conditions, and what the weather was like now. So you got to get it just right, really, and yeah. be prepared to be flexible. <laughs> Of course, it's getting um, it's getting warmer and nicer. It's just going to be a fantastic weekend. It's guaranteed this year. So, um, you know, that's a good thing about global warming, Jock. Yeah, that is, yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's interesting. The uh, June, we used to start our summer camps at the end of uh, the when the kids break up. And that week, the, that week in June was brilliant, went just before they broke up. And as soon as they break up, the weather craps out. <laughs> so you might just have it just have it perfect <laughs> it's all it's all booked in dave's saying that we can download last year's igc files from the website at eggslakes.uk so um yeah, people can do Excellent. that research um and one more comment here from tim and then we're going to wind it up um might people post on here what wing they'll expect to be flying and harness if possible certainly i would suggest you do that on the telegram group have a little bit of chat on there and maybe share a bit of kit information and chit chat and get a bit of enthusiasm revved up. That would be fantastic. So Jockey, um, perfect mate. We didn't even have much of a conversation about what this was about, did we? And as usual, you pulled it out of the bag with a fantastic presentation to support <laughs> it. I don't know how you do these things, but that was um, bang on the money. I don't know what your travel plans are. Obviously we're all hoping that you might be able to uh, make an appearance on the weekend itself and um we'll yeah see. i mean if i'm around i'll pop in yeah it'd be lovely to see you all. more than fantastic that would be really brilliant particularly if you can come on yeah, some, yeah. And there's some beer swilling that'd be great Brilliant. and um thanks very much everybody for attending and uh yeah, thank you everybody you. and good cheers. luck at the x legs cheers then everybody thanks very much Take care. Thank, you. thank you very much thanks james thanks jockey bye